Thank you all. I appreciate that. Uh, if you take your Bibles this morning and turn to Luke chapter 18. I'm really grateful to be with you. We had a wonderful time. Well, I had a wonderful time at the 8 o'clock service. And, uh, and uh, we are going to continue to pursue the Holy Spirit of God today. As we continue through our journey in our series, The Cost. You know, when I first came to the United States, I knew how to say four words in English. Hi, goodbye, yes, and no. People ask me all the time, how do you communicate with those foreign people all around us? I say, you need to learn four words. Hi, goodbye, yes, and no. Let me teach you how to communicate with the internationals. Are you ready? Four words. You ready? What are they? Hi, goodbye, yes, and no. And then, and then God will just allow you to communicate the language of the heart and the spirit and the mind. And God will just open the door. Well, hi, goodbye, yes, and no. When I first came to the United States... To cut the story short, it's a miracle that really God allowed me a visa to come in from a nation that normally takes about 10 years. My first try, 10 years to get a visa, my first try, uh, the consulate, the American consulate in Damascus gave me a five-year multiple entry to the United States. It got to, uh, to Martin, Tennessee. Anybody know where Martin, Tennessee is? Martin? Anybody know where Dyer, Tennessee is? Dyer? Oh, look at you. So, uh, so my roommate was from Dyer. And uh, Tommy looks at me, he's about 6'4", he's looking down at a 4'6", right here at me, and uh, in the dormitory room, and he says, Fadi. And, uh, no, I mean, he just he goes, do, he doesn't speak English, um, he doesn't speak Arabic, I don't speak English, so he goes, do you eat people? <laughs> now, I don't know what he's saying, but I'm trying to be nice. Now, you got to know Tommy to know that he will ask that kind of a question. He's weird. He used to watch Letterman with no sound and laugh his heart out. And, and Tommy, Tommy goes, do you eat people? Well, I'm trying to be nice. I know four words. Hi, goodbye, yes, and no. What do you think I said? I said, yes. <laughs> and Tommy, 6'4", runs to the grocery store, comes back with bags of groceries, Puts it down. He goes, you get hungry, eat food. <laughs> and I thought Americans are awesome. And so <clears throat> six months later, I'm learning some English. And I said, Tommy, no food. Fadi, get food. He goes, no, Tommy. I said, no, Fadi. He goes, no, Tommy. I said, why? He said, I don't want you to eat me. <laughs> I said, Tommy, you're weird. <laughs> <clears throat> I, am, I lived in Damascus, Syria. Our house was about a mile and a half from where the Apostle Paul met Ananias. And uh, the scales of his eyes fell, and the Spirit of God enlightened his soul. And after he'd come to meet the Lord on the road to Damascus, I've lived near history, never had a Christian history. I've lived near uh, the land where the glory of God shined on the Apostle Paul, and I've never met the glory of God. Until I came to Martin, Tennessee, and through the ministry of a small church, Eastside Baptist Church, the Spirit of God introduced me to His goodness and His grace and mercy and salvation. I began to learn what being a follower of Jesus Christ is all about, and I gave my life to Jesus in 1984, October 30th, 1984, two years later. I uh, surrendered to the ministry. My wife, Lindy, and I met in Martin, Tennessee. She looked at me one time. She said, i got to marry him. I've got to marry him. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> She'll be here in the third service. Don't tell her I said that. But uh, So anyway, uh, anyway, so Lindy and I married and went to work with the hotel industry, then came back to northwest Tennessee and went to seminary at Union, took my classes at Union, Southern Seminary classes, and then continued to pastor in Martin, Tennessee. I pastored the Redneck Church. That's why I have a twain to my... To my uh, anyway, if you're in Luke chapter 18, so, y'all okay? Are y'all all right? I did. I really pastored the Redneck Church. It was awesome. It was just, I went coon hunting, fishing. I mean, you call it, I, I did it. So anyway, uh, so, you know, you know, coming to Christ... Coming to Christ, the passion that we need to carry in our soul for the glory of God, the burning desire to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit of God that lives inside of us, that ought to never die in our spirit. If you've been 
to, and, and I'm telling you, today I believe the church is going through a, a revival. God is raising a generation of trailblazers. They're going to burn with the glory of God. They're going to go out with passion. I've always believed that the future generation following us, Pastor Wade and the others, they're going to bring redeeming revival to this nation. I believe in the future generation. If you've gone to Switzerland, Geneva, there is a wall there that uh, during, the, during the time of the Reformation, they've constructed a wall uh, there in Geneva. And on that wall, there's a written sentence there. It's written in Latin, translates in English, and here's what it says. After darkness comes the light. After darkness comes the light. That was the mission, the theme of the Reformation itself. And then we hear about following that years and decades later. We hear about people who lived in darkness and finally discovered the light. John Wesley was one of those who having, listen, listen written hymns and, and served and ministered only like me to recognize. He was just a religious man. And after discovering the light of God through the true gospel, John Wesley wrote the following. He said, when I preach... I want to be set on fire by the Holy Spirit of God. And then I want to have the crowd watch me burn. Oh God, etch in our heart the Spirit of God where we could burn for the glory of God that those who come in contact with us living in darkness will come to the light. In the name of Jesus. And I believe God is pruning the church today. Uh, John 15 tells us that we as people of God, we go through a pruning. Now I want you to understand, when God begins the pruning process, it's normally for the purpose of being fruit bearers and image bearers of the gospel. When God begins to prune us, it's not to... To, it's not to get to us to see how well we endure the process of sacrifice, but to prepare us to be fruit-bearing in the gospel. Now stand up with me in honor of the word of the living God, and let's look at Luke chapter 18 and verse 18, and, uh, and look at this encounter that really resembles so much of what a lot of people may believe and may be awakened to the reality that may not be true as their faith is in Christ. Listen, verse 18, the Bible says, Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Notice, he wants to inherit it. Not only receive it, but inherit it. Entitlement. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful. Instead of happy, sorrowful. For he was very rich. Do you see what hinders him at this point? And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, How hard it is for those who have riches to, in, to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? But he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, see, we've left all and followed you. So he said to them, assuredly, I said to you, there is no one that has left house, parents, brothers, wife, children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. Oh God, etch this word in our hearts. Lord, impress it on our minds. And help us to live it as our gospel testimony in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. You may be seated. This is a powerful encounter. By the way, this is not just an isolated story. Jesus 
had been awakening the people that he'd come encounter with to the fact that the people, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes and those who call themselves rabbis, they have bled the nation by taking away the resources of survival in that nation. They've become uh, money focused, position focused, possessions focused. And they have literally brought such confusion about what it feels like to inherit eternal life. Do you buy it? Do you work for it? Do you attain it? Do you bribe for it? And Jesus is dealing with it. As a matter of fact, in, uh, in, in, in the book of Luke and in chapter, uh, chapter 16 and verse 14, the Pharisees, Jesus said the Pharisees who were lovers of money, they've become lovers of money. He describes these people by being lovers of money. And this rich young ruler comes to Jesus. Now, I want to at the outset... Just kind of read him of this tag. All theologians, they titled this topic right here, the rich young ruler. I'd like to call him the poor young slave. The poor young slave. Because his possessions have become a hindrance, listen, to his mission. His, uh, his position have become a hindrance to his mission in life. Mark it down. Our mission is in life is a lot more important than our position or our possession. Our mission is a lot more important than our position or our possession. Now he comes to Christ and, and, and everybody titled him as the rich young ruler. But I believe he is the poor young slave. Later on the Bible says as, as we read the scripture that, that he was asking in verse 24. And Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful. He said it is hard that for those who, got, who, who depend on riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now I know in the early 9th century there was a theory that said since Jerusalem has several gates. One of these gates is designated for animals to come through. It was a low gate and animals have to be pushed through it. But listen, uh, it's impossible for a camel to get on his knees and be able to crawl through a gate. This was a physical impossibility. Then what does this mean? What does it mean when Jesus said it's impossible for those who depend on riches to enter the kingdom of God? Here's what God is saying. God is saying that I want to awaken the church so they can operate with different kind of wealth. I want the church to operate with different kind of understanding. I want the church to operate with a different kind of lifestyle. I want to recapture the definition of wealth from those who've turned it into materials, cars, and, 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 and houses, and lands. And, uh, because I don't know that I can call anyone rich just because they have money. And I don't know that I can call anyone ruler just because they command few people. If our riches and our position and rulership and authority does not lead to enhancing the kingdom of God, then our riches and our positions and our possessions have become a hindrance for us to be obedient disciples of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Three simple things I want to bring before you. Number one, I want you to see this rich young ruler's true identity. His true identity identity. He's really not a rich young ruler. He's the poor young slave. I want to strip him of this title for his sake. And I want to tell you, dear friend, that the only thing that can qualify any of us in life is our relationship to Jesus Christ our Lord. The only thing that qualifies us is our relationship to Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's a, a, a pastor that was, that pastors quite a sizable church in Atlanta. He went to preach in Africa in the nation of Uganda. And as, as, as he was waiting for the congregation to arrive, the Ugandan pastor said to him, Pastor, we're going to have to give time for our people to come and be seated and positioned. He said, watch as they come, and here they come by the thousands, carrying their plastic chairs and bringing it to this open church so they can put their chairs down and sit and worship all day long. And the arrogant Atlanta pastor looked at the African pastor and said, I'm going to be praying for you and the poverty that you have in the church of Africa. 
And the African pastor looked at the uh, American pastor and said to him, I'm going to be praying for you and your prosperity in America. I'm just amazed how much we've been able to accomplish without the Holy Spirit of God. I'm just amazed how much we're not willing to give away in order that we may experience a revival of the Spirit of the living God. Jim Elliott made the following statement as he served in the Ecuadors. And he said, my life is on the line. Here's what he said. He's no fool who give up what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. Did you hear that? You may be familiar with it. Here it is again. He's no fool who gives up what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. Friend, the only thing that qualifies you and I into a real identity of the kingdom is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Why was he the poor young slave? Here's why. Because he finished his life without a right relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to listen very carefully. Friend, if you come into this world with nothing and leave with everything but without a burning relationship with Jesus Christ, friend, it would have been better for you and I to not even be born than to burn in hell without Jesus. Are y'all all right? If you come into this world with nothing and leave with everything but not Jesus, it would have been better for us not to even be born. The only thing that qualifies us for eternity is a life that we have with Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God. This story has a sad ending. doesn't really have a good ending. He comes, this young man comes in, and here he is. He's on the road, and he comes to Jesus Christ. And when he comes in, it's been, it's been tradition in those days that you reach a certain level of riches. You can even kind of be carried on your servant's shoulders. It's a picture, the tragic picture, what we have oftentimes when we lift up mankind, men or women, to positions where only God belongs. You see, we've exalted man to the place where the glory should go only to Almighty God. If you uh, listen, uh, here's what I think we ought to do we ought to take leaders and pastors and preachers and ministry leaders and put them where they belong, not above on our shoulder where the ark, the presence of God belongs, but put them in front of the ark, going forward with a machete in their hands, cutting the weeds down for a future generation, and laboring for a cause that is bigger than themselves. Are you with me? It's like John the Baptist who said, I'm not the one, but I'm coming here to make the high places low and to take the crooked places and make it straight. I want to be a trailblazer for my nation to come to Jesus Christ. Oh, man. That's the mission that God has given us as the people of God. So he comes in, and he is excited. He mounts off, and then he begins to run to Jesus. You see, you've discovered his true identity. Let me talk to you about a, a real opportunity, his true opportunity, and he missed it. He comes in, and he comes running. Now, at the beginning, I'm thinking, he's running. That's absolutely awesome. I am intrigued with this young man. This young man is not just, he's not just, uh, uh, not, he's not disinterested. He's diligently coming. He's expectedly coming. He wants to come. He wants to learn. And he's talking to Jesus. And he said to Jesus, good teacher. Good teacher. There's a, there's a lesson to learn in here. Good. Agathos is the word. Extinguished. Exclusive, different, set apart type of teacher. Good, but not God. Distinguished, but not deity. You know, I believe you're good. You're good, aren't you, Jesus? I mean, you're good. You've been turning the water to wine. I know you're good. You've been raising people from the dead. I know you're good. You've been running around healing the sick. Look, I know you're good. I'm just not sure that you are God. He said, Fadi, why are you pressing this point? Here's why. Because we need to come to a place and time in our lives where we need to separate between good salvation 
and a God salvation. Good salvation that produces false converts and a God salvation that produces kingdom disciples. Kingdom disciples. The title of our series is The Cost. Kingdom disciples who will pay the cost. Good as opposed to God. Good salvation as opposed to God-given salvation. Friend, I think it's time to discover that God demands that we lay our life on the line. Jaber, who is a, is a young man by the name of Jaber from Iraq. I met him in Turkey when I was ministering in a refugee camp. And Jaber would come in. He had been thrown out of Iraq. ISIS had, had come in and demolished his home, killed his oldest son, runs away with the rest of his family, lands in Turkey. He is grieving. He is in sorrowfulness. He had only learned about Jesus as a good teacher, good prophet, good guy, the man upstairs. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? We call him the man upstairs, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and he's learned and what, what, just he's a good guy, he's a good teacher. So he's in grief and he's walking by a, a tent there in the refugee camp and he hears a story that has been told about Mary. And he says, that's a familiar sound to me. He goes right in and he finds few guys reading the gospel and worshiping in Turkey. And as that, uh, he stands outside and one person says, why don't you just come right in here? Just come in here. And Jabir decided, no, 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 no. I grew up as a, as a Muslim and I don't really want to risk being persecuted here in this camp. So he said, I'm not doing that. But so he goes to sleep. And as he went to sleep, God in a dream shows up to him. He said to me, he said, Fadi, I saw a man standing by a tree saying, come, come to me. And Jabir said, I woke up. I said, well, what is this dream all about? The next day he passes by that tent. <clears throat> and as he passes by that tent, he hears people reading the Bible and worshiping. He goes home, goes to sleep. The same dream. A man says, come third night the same way and he said I woke up screaming what you want from me what do you want from me and he says I am your God and I want you to come to me he goes back to that tent he hears them talking about Jesus he recognizes Jesus came to me in my dreams gives his life to Jesus today he no longer looks at Jesus as good he looks at Jesus as God and he has a church in Athens. Today, they left Turkey, went to Athens, and he's reaching for his people to come and meet that God that he encountered. If you only have a good salvation, think with me, you will work hard to keep it. If you have a God salvation, God, who gave himself to the uttermost, will keep you. If you have a good salvation, you will only learn to obey the law. But if you have a God salvation, there's liberty by the Spirit of God to those who live intimately in their new identity. If you have a good salvation, you will only try to give their tre your treasures and talents and services. But if you have a God salvation, you will give your life for the gospel. If you have a good salvation, you will live in fear of not being good enough. If you have a God salvation, you will live by faith in the one who died and gave his life for your sake and mine. You will give your life in return. I was flying back from Ethiopia. And I was flying back from Ethiopia. I, there was a young lady sitting next to me. Well, this gentleman came to sit next to me. And um, he, is, uh, he is sitting there. And the first thing he did before she came, he leaned over into my chair. And so now he's sitting in his chair and half of my chair. I had been in Ethiopia for about three weeks teaching pastors and, and working and doing conferences. And I was literally wore out. I thought, Lord, I, don't, I need some rest. I, normally when I'm on the plane, I've got my Bible with me. I'm looking for opportunities. And I was so wore out, I was selfish that day. And I said, Lord, I just want to take a nap. I'm one of those, when I fly, I don't take naps. I don't sleep. I just sit, study, do whatever I did. That's my way of relaxing. And this gentleman, this, I was so tired. This man came in, sat in his chair and half of my chair. Need not explain. So he, he just, he, he did. 
And I thought, Lord, I've been working for three weeks. Can I take a break? And all of a sudden, he looks at me and he goes, this is not my seat. I said, it's not. He said, no. I said, thank you, Jesus. I said, where is your seat? He said, right behind you in that corner seat. I said, okay. A few minutes later, there comes this young lady. She's carrying her ticket. She's looking for 26H. 26H. She said, she go, 26H. I said, 26H, right here, right here. Come sit right here. And he was about to kill me. He stared at me. And he got up, went back there. And she came and sat next to me. She grew up as a Coptic Orthodox. I grew up as an Eastern Orthodox in Syria. And for 13 solid hours coming out of Addis Ababa, we came out. She would look at me and she goes, what do you do? I said, I'm a minister of the gospel. She said, good. I've got questions for you. And for 13 hours, we landed in Dublin, took off, and kept on talking about the gospel. She kept asking. She said, I'd ask my priest. He would not answer. We talked about salvation, grace. We talked about the goodness of God. We talked about God as deity, as awesome God. And at the end of 13 hours, we're about to land where we need to land in Dulles, in, in Washington, and Mary looks at me and she goes, what's next? I said, next is for you to do what I have done. is to lay down your position and your possession and anything that keeps you from coming to Jesus and give your life to Jesus. She goes, this is it. She goes, well, uh, you know, well, can I do it here? I said, absolutely you can. So we sat down. I said, are you sure you want to do this? She goes, yes, I do. So she looks at me, and I said, all right, pray with me. I am not really giving my life to God on your behalf. You're giving your life to God, but I want to lead you as somebody led me. And we bowed our head, and we began to pray, and she gave her life to Jesus. And she said, oh, he is my God. I said, Mary, he's your God, and that is good. Are you with me? She said, do you know that my family's in the back? <laughs> She gets up and she goes, hey, I just gave my life to Jesus Christ. And tears are coming down from people sitting all around us. I knew there was a madman who wants to kill me, but I, I just bolted out of that plane as quickly. Now listen, this rich young ruler had an opportunity to know Christ and to know him deeply. And we see that his identity was untrue. We see, listen to me, we see that his opportunity was true to come to Jesus. But he chose not to take advantage of that. But Jesus, the Bible said, looked at him. This is absolutely beautiful. Jesus looked at him, the Bible said, and loved him. Jesus loved him. That word love literally means agape him. Agape him. Mark chapter 10 tells us God agape him. He didn't condemn him. He said, look. You, you, before I answer your questions about whether I'm good or God, I want to know, does what I, what is all that I've done, does it appeal to your soul that I'm not just a prophet, I'm not just a priest, but I'm a prophet, priest, and king? I am God. And then he said to him, I want you to go and sell all that you have. Jesus loved him. Now, this invitation is awesome. He said, go sell all that you have, watch this, and come follow me. There's one thing you lack. Now, when Jesus said there's not one, not none good but God, he wasn't saying I'm not good enough. Jesus was saying, I don't want you to take the word good lightly because I'm the only good on the face of the earth. There's none good but one, and that is God Almighty. Are you with me? And he said, but I want you to discover me not just as good. I want you to discover me as God, as God he said, you got one thing to do. I want you to go sell and come follow me. I want you to sell all that you have that has become a hindrance for you to discover me for my true identity in Christ. You see, salvation is not what you have. It's who you have. Salvation is not what I have. Listen, it, it, in possessions, it's who I have in me, living inside of me. That's true salvation. Are you with me? And then you'll pay the cost. Here's what he said to him. He said to him, he said, I want you to sell all you have and come. You'll think that would have made him happy. But the Bible says he was very sorrowful. And he went away. Listen. He went away at an opportunity. Are you, are, are you going to go away too? 
Are you fixing to leave this place knowing that God is speaking to you and saying, I agape you? He begins to feed agape into his life. Didn't condemn him. He said, it's good that you came. It's good that you came. And God is reaching out to you and saying, enough of this sensory Christianity. Where we fall in love with the church instead of Christ. Are you with me? Would to God that will begin to develop a lifetime of commitment and devotion to Christ, which will make us fall in love with his church. Are you with me? I mean, look, he went away sorrowful, and here he is playing with his toys and his mansion. And then all of a sudden, after the resurrection, after the resurrection, you'll see it happening. The Holy Spirit is coming down. 120 disciples are being baptized with the glory of God. And he's at home playing with his toys. You see it happening. He is at home playing with his toys. And Jesus walks through the door. And peace comes into the hearts of those that are there. We call him rich. But he missed it. Before that, Jesus was raising Lazarus from the dead. We call them rich. But he missed it. He's not the rich young ruler. He's the poor young slave. He's the poor young slave. Oh God, give us true salvation. Give us people who will quit getting right with the church and start getting right with God. Because with God, nothing is impossible. With man, all things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. He goes away. I beg you, don't go away. You may have something that is keeping you from really making that decision to come to Jesus Christ today and discover him not as a good savior. Let's do away with this Oprah Christianity that says go somewhere where they don't preach conviction. I'm telling you, friend, you cannot preach without the agape spirit inside of you that brings conviction for the purpose of conversion. Are y'all all right? Conviction leads to real conversion. Had you think, I've lived near the, 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 the apostolic anointing of the apostle Paul. Never heard one sermon that taught me that I need to confess my sins and come to Jesus. And so he runs away. Watch the picture in here. This section is closed when the disciples said, then who can be saved? Verse 31, then he took the twelve aside and said to them, behold... We're going up to Jerusalem. Now he told them. Now Jesus wasn't telling the rich man, you're not going to get anything back in return. He did tell him earlier that for those who will receive many times in this present time and in the age to come, eternal life. He said, you're not going to go empty handed. You're going to have the richness of all that God is inside of you. But then Jesus demonstrated what it means to not walk away. And he said in verse 31, then he took the twelve aside, said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon, and they will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Watch, this is beautiful. Jesus said, he went away, but I'm not going away. I'm going toward my cross. You see, Jesus was telling the rich man, sell all you have and come, and I'll give you a cross on a dusty road road. Sell all you have and come. Give away your possessions and your positions which become a hindrance for your salvation. And listen, and come and I'll give you power and authority. Sell all you have and come. And Jesus, he said to the disciples, follow me. Here's what it means to not walk away. And Jesus put, set his face toward Jerusalem and he darted toward Jerusalem, resolute toward the cross, and began to demonstrate that his, his obedience to the Father. And he knew that they're going to deliver him, but he ran toward his destiny, not running away from their destiny. The rich man ran away from his destiny. Jesus ran away toward his destiny. This morning, you give your life to Jesus. You won't run away from your destiny. You will run into your destiny in Jesus Christ. And Jesus knew he was going to be delivered. Watch this. From the Jewish hand, the Jewish hand into the Gentile hand. We sometimes pass through that. You know what that means? It means once you are delivered by the Jews to the Gentiles, you're no longer part of that covenant. 
You're outside of the covenant. That's why they took a scapegoat, sent him into the utter darkness to die on behalf of the nation for the sin of a nation. Jesus represented that individual outside in the darkness. When he was delivered to the Gentiles, the Jews were saying, you're not part of our covenant. But thanks be unto God, Christ came to give us a new covenant. It's a covenant that says, I'm a child of God, I'm a son of the Most High, I'm a co-heir with Jesus, I'm the apple of His eye, I'm a true blue blood, I belong to Jesus Christ, I am Messiah born, eternity going. Are y'all all right? Stand up with me, please. Father, we present because we have been transformed. We present because we have been blessed. We present because your word speaks. And this morning I pray for those who have been latching on, possessing, holding on to a good salvation. Maybe I can just do enough to be enough. But Lord, I know that I need to do, what I need to do is to say yes to you. For salvation is not the doing of something, but the receiving of someone. Salvation is not the doing of something. It is the receiving of someone. And I pray today for those who have not received Jesus, that they will receive him in the name of Jesus. And if you agree in your heart, say amen. And if you here want to give your life to the Lord, we have awesome, awesome ministers. Our dear pastor can consult with you. You can fill out that form, say, I need someone to connect with me, 623-623, because I'm ready to move from the good life into the God life.